Well, hello, gardeners. We're waiting for people to come in, but welcome to episode three. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, we literally just said that, and I already <laughs> forgot. <laughs> episode three of In the Garden with Greenland, and you're here with Tina and Joe this morning. Good morning. And、uh, today's topic is edible perennials.、Mm -hmm. So、uh, this is kind of, you know, edible plants obviously are huge right now, Tina. Yes. That's what everybody wants between edibles and house plants. Absolutely. Yeah.、Um, but you may not necessarily know how many options there are for perennial edibles that you can plant in the ground and they'll come back year after year. Yeah, and the difference between those and edibles, we might be more permanent edibles. We might be familiar with such as apples, right? Cherries. You know, blueberries in our climate is that the perennial ones take up much less less space, right? right. So for our compact yards, they're a fantastic choice. Absolutely. Yeah. So、mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about things like strawberries, right? Very popular. Asparagus.、Mm -hmm. um, you know, grapevines, rhubarb, even kiwi. A lot of people don't realize that you、yeah. can grow hardy kiwis here. Yeah.、Um, so that's kind of what we're covering in today's episode. We're also going to be talking about pruning as well. Yeah. That's we're, a question we're getting a lot right now, both、uh, in store and、uh, on the 6:30 Chad Garden Show on Sundays,、um, and everybody's wondering when can I prune? What can I prune now? So we'll kind of weave that through the podcast today. Absolutely. And so today's date is April 15th. Yeah. So、um, it's it's that time of year for yeah. sure. Yeah.、Um, so. Lots for today's show. Now we want to make sure that、uh, you know. Obviously, we're filming live, so if you're watching us live, just a reminder: you can ask us questions at any point. Our lovely moderator Tyler will forward those questions to us, and、uh, and then we can address those. And as well,、uh, just a reminder: you know, if if you can't listen to us live, or if you miss part of the show, you're busy doing other things. <laughs> the whole thing will be available in video form on our YouTube channel, which、yeah. is Greenland Garden. Um, also on our Facebook page, you can view it, and we will have the audio version on all the major platforms. Yes. So you can listen to us on the go. That's right. So Tina, I'll get you to switch your mic just to the other side. Yep.、Yeah. So、uh, why don't we start off then, Tina, with strawberries? We can talk a little bit about that.、Um, strawberries, probably the most popular plant in this group, at least in our climate. And we sell a lot of strawberries every a lot. year. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> people are asking about them sometimes as early as January because、uh, what ends up happening is people that come in later in the season miss out on it. Yes. And then the next、yeah. year they want to make sure that they get them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then they're right on it. Absolutely. Yeah. But、um, mm -hmm. so what we'll kind of start with is differentiating between the three different groups、right. that exist within strawberries. So you have. Ever bearing, you have day neutral and you have June bearing. Right. And a lot of people want to know kind of what the difference is there. What are the benefits and drawbacks?、Um, a big thing is just kind of clarifying, and I've been guilty of this too. Ever bearing versus day neutral because they're not the same thing, but、right. they often get interchanged、Group、together. Yeah. 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 And you'll see that even on tags, they'll refer to a day neutral as an ever bearing variety. Right. Um, but there is a distinct difference. That being, ever-bearing types are kind of an older breeding of day neutral types, where they do produce multiple crops per season, but they do not produce continuously through the season. So the two biggest examples of ever-bearing types would be like Fort Laramie and Ozark Beauty. Those those are ones that you see a lot. Yeah.、Um, the fruit is smaller. It's very sweet. Um, but the best varieties will be fairly prolific producers when they're producing. Right.、Um, and a major sort of、uh, plus with ever-bearing types is that they don't produce as many runners. So they're a good plant if you don't have a lot of space or if you're growing in containers, which、right. we'll talk about Great also. Right. Great container. Yep. Yep.、Um, the day neutral. What that means is that so your June-bearing types, which we'll talk about shortly.、Um, Depend on day length to decide when they're going to flower and produce fruit.、Right. Day neutral types ignore day length, so they will continuously produce through the season. And probably the best example of that is TriStar. Right. TriStar is a very heavy producer that will continuously produce through the season. Yeah, nice size berries on it as well. Yep. 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Another example would be Seascape. That's a popular one. Yep. Um, so then we come to our June bearing types. Right. So in the Which June... Which technically still won't be June in Alberta. Right. Right? <laughs> Hence the discussion about day length hours. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So with June bearing types, a lot of the time you will see it happening later in the season for us because it's going to happen during the sort of longest day length hours, yeah, right? Yeah, true summer days, yeah. True summer days. Um, the benefit, a lot of people ask me, they'll say, well, why should I even plant a June bearing type if it's only bearing in June? Right. Typically, the harvest period is three weeks long. Yeah. And you are getting very heavy yields during that time. Yeah. And the fruit is larger and really higher quality than yes. what you get in the other types. So that's kind of the the reason why you might want to plant a June bearing type. Yeah, if people are, you know, uh, expecting, you know, what's close to like a supermarket size strawberry, that would kind of be the June bearing types, right? Exactly. Whereas the others, you know, might be a little bit more dessert sized, especially the ever bearing ones, right? Yeah. But there's still the flavor on all of them grown in the ground is amazing. It's, it's there's no comparison between just like with any type of veggie, really, right? Right. Uh, there's no comparison between the flavor that you get on homegrown strawberries versus grocery store right. ones. Right. Absolutely. They're yeah. just so much better. Yeah, they do have a flavor more reminiscent if you've ever been out in the wild, you know, hiking or camping and tasted a true wild strawberry in Alberta. Like they they have that true strawberry taste, not the kind of pale blush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bite into nothing, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, and a couple good examples of June bearing types are honey oil and kent. So th those are kind of the, the more common ones. Yeah. So as far as like planting and care and all that goes with strawberries, Tina, mm -hmm. first thing is they are um, self-fertile. Right. So you don't need to have more than one plant or more than one variety, but you will get heavier yields if you plant them, obviously, in patches. That's why we sell them in six packs. Right. Right. And then the best yields will come from cross-pollination between varieties. Right. So if you're growing a day neutral, uh, let's say you pick up a TriStar, if you plant it with Seascape, that's going to give you the absolute best yields. Yeah. So, but... Um, and as far as preparing the site, all that, you need to have full sun. Yes. Lots of sunlight. They like a lean, kind of slightly sandy soil. They need good drainage. Yeah, right? and, and lean. So this is one plant, you know, pr plant. I guess a lot of perennial um, edibles are similar to that. And they don't require really rich soil. So they don't require that big addition of like compost or sea soil added to it. They do. And again, strawberries love a little bit of that sandy, well-drained soil for sure. Last season, uh, my strawberry patch, I still got good yields, mm -hmm. but they were not happy with all the excess rain we had. I really had to battle the slugs. Yeah. So um, they do, again, they re really thrive in that well-drained soil. Absolutely. Um, and that's where, like, depending on the location, sometimes raised beds are a good way to go. Yeah. Um, you do want to be careful with, you know, how exposed a raised bed is and how high it is. Yeah, I just saw a question on one of the plant groups this morning. Someone was asking if they could plant strawberries in a raised planter. And one of the other gardeners did suggest, you know, if planting in raised beds, maybe choose to mulch those um, strawberry plants for the winter, just yeah. for that extra layer of insulation, especially if we don't get good snow cover. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah. But... Um, yeah, so and then the other big thing would be, first of all, you can't expect top yields during the first season. Right. In fact, the recommendation for establishing a good strawberry patch is actually to deadhead all of the flowers the first season. Yeah. Which is hard for people to do, right? Yeah. Um, but ideally, if you're planting in the ground, deadhead them the whole season so that they can establish a strong root system. Right, because we have to remember with perennial edibles, we're, it's really that first season, just like with flower and perennials, that first season is all about root development and the plant establishing itself. And once established, you'll reap the rewards, but you just have to have patience, especially when we get to asparagus, that requires some patience, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And then um, obviously most strawberries produce runners, right? So managing the patch as far as how it propagates over time is an important part of getting the best yields. Right. And what you will find is, you know, plants, once they reach three to four years old, 
you have to start rejuvenating the patch and actually removing the older plants. Right. Um, along the way, you're also thinning out extra runners so that it doesn't get too overcrowded. Right. So those are a couple of things to keep in mind as well. But definitely, you'll find the plants, again, once they reach that third or fourth year, they start to lose their productive value. Right. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. And uh, just a reminder as well, if you are tuning in live, definitely give us any questions that you might have. And honestly, it doesn't necessarily have to be about what we're talking about mm -hmm. either. Um, any gardening related questions, Absolutely. give us a shout yeah. and we will address those. Um, Joe's, or, um, Tyler's got a question for us now. Sure. Yeah, looking to start a small fruit area in the garden, hoping for a small cherry and plum and maybe currants, red and black varieties. Okay. okay. So small cherries, uh, obviously the Romance series. Uh, if you look up U of Sask cherries, uh, they've done a fabulous um, breeding program um, and they've introduced a whole slew um, of sour cherries and they're available in small tree or bush form and mm -hmm. we carry all of those. So do a little bit of uh, research um, while we're still at home on those. Um, and then the uh, currants, Typically, you'll see most garden centers only carry like one or two named varieties of red or black currants. Um, and then for plums, mm. that's a big conversation, right? With yeah. plums, you have to understand that only certain plums will pollinate other plums. So we have like a chart right. at, <laughs> in the garden center, yeah. right? If you want, first you'll choose what kind of plum you want, what um what color? You want that deep purple? You want the, the red? Like Brook Gold is popular. Mount Royal's popular. But they all require a different pollinator. So what you'll do is choose what you want for a fruit. And then uh, whatever garden center you're visiting locally, they will suggest the other variety that will successfully pollinate that other one. Because it's all about bloom time. You do need varieties that are, are going to uh, bloom at the, the same time. Western Sand Cherry is a... Um, smaller shrub that actually is very effective at pollinating many plum varieties. Yeah. So often in the garden center, they'll say, if you don't have room for two plum trees in your yard, choose one of the plums that that small Western sand cherry will pollinate. Right. And it's actually a beautiful little shrub in spring when it does bloom. It very is. Very fragrant. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I would shout out as well the variety Pembina as far as plums. Yes. The fruit is really good on it, but it also has a blooming period that overlaps with a lot of the other plums. So it's a great pollinator itself. Yeah. 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 And they do say that like Mount Royal is one they consider self-pollinating. Yes. But again, experts suggest plant two of them or something that will pollinate Mount Royal just for to ensure success. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. So we get that question a lot on the 630 Chad Garden Show about plum pollination. Plums are a complicated one for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Um, just wrapping up with the strawberries then, uh, the only other thing would be, so just, just with that first year care, Tina, obviously making sure that they're well watered like any other plant, yeah. uh, when, when they're just establishing that, uh, root system, a root booster fertilizer every two weeks for that first season. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And after that nutrient wise, you could till in some bone meal at the mm -hmm. beginning of the season in, you know, in, in and around the plants. But other than that, they're not a heavy feeder right. whatsoever. Yeah, you, you'll, you'll find if you grow them in soil that's too rich, if you over fertilize, the yields are very poor. Right. Yeah. So, so that's strawberries. We have another question. Is it okay to prune my 35 year old crab apple tree? I need to reduce height by at least two feet. It is 12 feet high. Okay, so they're wondering if it's okay to prune their 35 year old crab apple tree. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if they can hear you, Tyler, when you actually ask the question, so I'm just kind of repeating it. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so with, uh, with, the, um, with crab apples, with fruit trees in general, now is the time to prune those. Yeah. Uh, we're at mid-April, so before bud break is kind of when you want to do that, but after, you know, winter is over. Right. Um, so, and the general rule of thumb is no more than one third off in mm -hmm. one season. Yeah, so two feet is, is really insignificant on that tree. So yeah, don't worry about taking two feet off. Just ensure it's done and, you know, 
in an appropriate way, like the pruning's done correctly. We don't want to see, Winston was actually headed out on last weekend to do some pruning on an apple tree that had been kind of topped. And oh, so yeah. for two years now, the homeowner has been dealing with all these water, weak water sprouts sprouting up and a very unnatural look for the tree. So just have someone who uh, is familiar with how to prune do it for you. Yeah. All right, so uh, moving on then, Tina, to I think the next one is rhubarb mm -hmm. we can kind of talk about. We don't have an example of it. Um, I didn't even do my Vanna thing showing the strawberry plants. I but know. Strawberry plants. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as far as rhubarb, Tina, uh, one of the easiest, you know, old-fashioned perennial edibles that you can plant and Absolutely. grow. Absolutely. You find them at how many old farmsteads? Like it's just been grown forever. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's really good varieties available. You know, people uh, people come into the perennial section and they want a sweet, you know, red stocked rhubarb, and that's really all that's available now. Yeah. You're not going to find like bitter or sour flavored ones at this point. Right. Not likely anyway at the uh, garden centers. So you know, varieties like Canada Red, Strawberry Red, German Wine. Those yeah. are all really good ones that are typically available. Yeah. And um, this is one, again, kind of a common theme with these, where the first year you're really not harvesting, the first year you're establishing them. Right. So <clears throat> rhubarb likes, again, full sun is ideal. It will grow in partial shade, mm -hmm. but just know that it's going to take longer for it to establish and get to the point where you're getting good yields right. on it. Right, yeah. Um, but they are, the big thing with rhubarb uh, is they're fairly heavy feeders. So different from, and this is where we make the differentiation between plants that produce fruit and plants that you're harvesting foliage from, where typically plants that you harvest foliage from will be heavy feeders. Right. Right. Whereas plants that produce fruit produce better fruit when they're stressed. And that's why we don't overfeed them. Right. So in the case of rhubarb, they like a lot of compost added to the soil. They like a lot of moisture. Yes. So. Yeah. People do think that rhubarb are this so incredibly easy to grow so just throw them any hot sunny dry spot and they'll thrive once established but it is true that they do actually like a um soil that is richer and isn't hot packed dry um clay um i think people think they're just so easy to grow because they come across grandmas you know or great grandparents that have had these patches you know, growing on the farmstead forever. And I would say the biggest reason they are is because they were left alone, right? Yes. One thing about rhubarb is choose your planting location carefully. Mm -hmm. They're a beautiful ornamental plant. That's what I love about them so that they actually blend into the perennial garden or the landscape. Um, but the one big mistake you can make with rhubarb is moving it around too much. Right. You know, a lot, yeah. another, a lot of perennials, you know, could be moved around season after season and they wouldn't blink but rhubarb once it's planted it prefers to stay where it is undisturbed definitely another question yeah so we got two uh should raspberry canes be cut back in the spring so the question was should raspberry canes be cut back in the spring this will depend on the type yes so uh there's two basic types of raspberries which are primocane and floricane mm -hmm. And the primocane types, primocane types will uh, produce on new wood. So those ones you can technically mow back every single year and you'll still get fruit. Right. A popular variety a lot of people have is Double Delight. Right. Right. Now with that, um, just to kind of clarify, if you're mowing them back every year, so the reason why they call that one Double Delight is because you get two crops of fruit on it but only if you leave last season's wood because they will first produce on last season's wood and then they'll produce on this season's wood. Yeah. So if you want the double crop, you're not mowing them down every year. You're thinning out the third year growth and leaving um, last right. year's growth. Yeah. And, and, and you can see, like, so sometimes that pruning's done best in late fall when you can still visually see what the difference in the canes, right? Yeah the second year growth will be woodier than the, for that current year's growth. Right. right. The floricane types are more old-fashioned. You don't see them as much in garden centers anymore. 
So if you have a newer planting of raspberries, they're not likely to be that tight. But just to be on the safe side, if you know the variety you have, Google it and make sure. But with the floricane types, they only produce on second year wood. So you have to make sure that you are leaving last year's growth, but again, thinning out the oldest growth on those right. guys. And again, you'll be able to differentiate between those canes, right? After fall, that you'll see still the little spurs, and and the canes again have that you know slight woodiness and brownness to it in the second year. Those are the ones are going to be pruning to the ground, and they so the prime or the floor cane is a little bit more difficult for newer gardeners yeah. to get a hold of pruning wise. Right. Yeah. Okay, next, whoa, we got lots of questions coming now. Okay, lots of uh, questions. I have two half scabs that don't produce. I'm assuming because they have the same variety. How do I know which variety to buy to help with pollination? So the question was on has, has caps. They have two plants that aren't producing and they're wondering what to buy to kind of solve that problem as far as varieties. Yeah, they'll have to know what variety they currently have in order for uh, a garden center to recommend something that will uh, pollinate. Yeah, so has caps are another one that's slightly tricky. They're not self-fertile. You have to have two different varieties and they have to... Uh, overlap with uh, bloom periods and my understanding is like I don't think they're as complicated as plums are right but not all of them are compatible with each other right so. yeah and again so that's why the garden center has like a little chart of what will what will work together so yeah yeah, yeah. so if you can find the tag or if you remember what variety you've got uh, so this one's kind of a two-parter so how best to amend heavy dry soil also how to divide iris and when Okay, so the first part of that... How to amend uh, hard, dry soil. So right. we talk about this a lot on the 630 Check Garden Show. And a couple of weeks ago when we were on the show, we said to someone, okay, so every year it's a great idea to add, you know, an inch or two of compost onto the top of a bed and lightly work it in, right? We don't try to overwork the soil and we always wait till it's slightly dried in spring so we're not damaging uh, the structure of the soil. However... Um, if you have been doing so for two to three years, you're still not noticing a difference. Sometimes you have to bite the bullet and excavate a good amount of soil, like anywhere from four to eight inches. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that really poor soil and bring in a really nice garden mix blend. And all garden centers who sell bulk soil products will sell like a garden mix blend. So it's, it's a bit better than topsoil. It's got some really nice peat and sand and things mixed in to make it a little fluffier um, because sometimes for instance people who create a brand new uh, flower bed on top of uh, you know say in a new development right that is just on existing hard packed topsoil that topsoil is in no way suitable for growing trees shrubs perennials edibles so we always recommend to someone with a new yard excavate eight inches of all that topsoil and that's how you create a bed right? Yeah. Putting in the work now will save you so much grief and time and money and effort later on down the road. Yeah. Just that straight pack top. So it can be fighting a losing battle. And then for dividing iris. Dividing mm -hmm. iris uh, slightly varies depending on the type, um, but not by much. So bearded types, which are the ones that have the flat fans of leaves and the big showy fluffy flowers. There's also dwarf versions of them. Those are best divided in August, actually. So they're done a little bit earlier than a lot of other perennials mm -hmm. are. Yep. And those guys, you are basically lifting with a fork. They have a very shallow root system, cutting them into pieces. And what you'll find with bearded iris is the center dies out after a few years. So you're cutting that dead center out and throwing it away and just replanting the outer newer portions. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, cut the foliage back to about six inches or so, which will just reduce stress to the root system from doing that. Um, with Siberian types or other types that have more of the grassy foliage, uh, those can be done just in the fall like a lot of other perennials are done. And again, with really old plants, the center will die out, so cut it out. But you can either take a shovel or a sharp knife and just cut it into pieces. Yeah, and I believe um, in the last fall you and Ty did film 
a dividing and transplanting perennials yes uh video in the garden so that's up on our youtube channel greenland garden as well um, keep an eye open for um, this coming Saturday, Ty. Um, he filmed Getting Ready for Spring with Aaron, our hard goods manager. And so that content will be available on Saturday. And it is our whole um, amending soil in spring, right? Uh, and uh, lots of other stuff like that. Leaf cleanup, uh, pest control, right? With things like dormant oil and and lime sulfur, so uh, lots of really, really good tips for everything we should be doing in the garden right now. Yeah, so if you were registered for our class getting ready for spring, getting your yard ready for spring, this is the whole class in video form mm, yeah. because, of course, all of our in-store classes have been cancelled, so uh, that's how you can get the information. Yeah. So. Okay, so we got some rapid fire. We're going to loop back to the hats caps because she replied. Um, they were traded at a plant ex exchange, so they don't know the variety. Is there a way to figure out the variety of hash caps she has? So the hash caps mm -hmm. that were previously asked about, they were from a plant exchange. Wondering how she can figure out what variety they are. Uh, it's very unfortunately, difficult. Unfortunately, yeah, that's going to be next to impossible. Um, yeah, you the, would need, sorry. The one thing, sorry, that she could do is now that they're planted, just really watch this season at the timing of the blooming. And so, because some are considered like early, earlier bloomers and then mid bloomers in the varieties. And so the only thing I could suggest is when they are start to bloom for her, to give a call to the garden center because then they can consult the varieties they have and whether they would suggest an early or a mid blooming one to try and match that up. Because um, we know which ones we've got in our garden and when they bloom, so we could somewhat compare, right? Right. The only other thing maybe that you might be able to do is, you know, send pictures or samples to like a real expert on fruit, like maybe somebody from the University of Saskatchewan. I don't know. They might be able to identify it. Yeah. Kind of grasping at straws. Right. But no, they might. Yeah. Maybe. Because they did develop a majority of what you're seeing sold in the garden centers. Again, that's that U of Sask uh, website, that fruit breeding program. Right. Yeah. Okay, we're looking for some ideas for a small ornamental tree to go on the east facing house, uh, narrow and shady front garden, uh, close to the city sidewalk, shaded by elms. So ideas for a small ornamental tree, east facing, shaded by elms. Mm. Near the house, um, okay, so some things that come to mind for me, um, give me a second here. See, a, a lot of the best ones, some of the best ones we don't even sell anymore because of disease issues, right? Yeah. Um, something like an Ohio Buckeye might be a possibility um, because they're slow growing, relatively compact. They are a low-headed tree, so keep that in mind. You can't really, like, walk under it. Right. And they drop nuts, but they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, One of the more compact lindens, but again, like, what do they consider small ornamental? Right. Um, is is the, the tricky part of that question. Because, again, like, even an Ohio Buckeye or those smaller lindens are still getting about 15 feet wide, for sure. Yeah. Um, so if something's smaller than that, the unfortunate thing is that east exposure and shaded by elms. That's um, true, too. You know what, yeah. I think one thing they might want to consider is more of an ornamental evergreen, truthfully, because yeah. it's quite a shaded spot, um, and it's a protected spot because of those elms, and all evergreens thrive in... Um, cooler, shadier spots, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's so many smaller compact forms available than people actually know. Right. Um, and then you've got year round interest because, you know, something as small and ornamental and cute as a Princess K plum won't be appreciative of the shade. That's the problem. That's so, true. But you know what I would say, like even like bringing, emailing a photo in or um, uh, to like even here um, to gardening at greenlandgarden.com sometimes a photo of the spot makes it a lot easier for us to visualize, visualize right. what we would recommend right one that did just come to mind though uh, is amur maple that's um, that's something yeah. that that would be really good um, probably about 10 feet wide on those especially Beautiful. there's some kind of dwarf varieties but yes. they do very well in a shadier spot yes. and they have gorgeous red fall color yeah. so that 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 would be one that's a great one okay and 
last one on the list. Every year I struggle with Black Mountain my native tree. Is it possible to ever eradicate it or <sighs> will I be a slave to it for the rest of its life? Yeah. So black knot. I love that you say that. Will I be a slave to it for the rest of my life? Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it feels that way if you have a tree that you're pruning every year, right? The problem with black knot is that it is persistent not only on trees that are widely planted as ornamentals, being maydays and like Schubert Schubert choke choke cherries, cherries yeah. but it also um, exists on native trees that yeah. are all over the place yeah. on our native choke cherries. Yeah and on May Days and such that have naturalized, like come out, um, come out of people's gardens right. and escaped into the wild. So it's, it's always going to be around, unfortunately, unless we enter some kind of a climate cycle that just doesn't favor its reproduction. Um, but the way things have been for the last 10, 15 years, Black Knot has just taken over. Yeah, the problem with black knot is that yeah, it, when those when it's present in it, its active season would be in the spring and summer, right? Um, the wind and the rains uh, spread the spores, right? Mm -hmm. That's how this is dispersed from host to host. And the problem is, is that you could be um, very diligent at cleaning up the May Day in your yard, but two yards over, there's a house where they where they don't look where at they it. don't look at it at all, right? Yeah. Um, some homeowners have no idea that they even have it on their trees because they just don't look at their trees, right? Yeah. And because for so many years we planted so many May Days and Schubert choke cherries, it's just prevalent. I mean, in the county, years ago, our horticulturist said we're not going to pay spend on the labor to continue to prune this out because we just the crews cannot keep up with it. It just, you've got to let it just run its course. And so um, it's your choice as a homeowner, right? The problem is, is that, well, not the problem, I guess, the trees continue to thrive. Yes. For many, many, many years. Our neighbor across the street, his Schubert choke chair, in the winter, you can see when the leaves are gone, it is loaded with black knot. Yeah. But in the spring and summer, it's beautiful because it's got the gorgeous purple foliage, the blooms, the fruit, and so... You know, because they continue to thrive, people don't think it's a serious disease. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, we'll get off to, now that we've done some rapid fire questions, we'll get on to more perennial edibles. But we should mention that this Friday at 5 p.m., um, we're doing a little cocktail party via Zoom. So, yes. a lot of people have been using Zoom to uh, catch up with family members and have gatherings and we're going to do the same thing. So there'll be a handful of the Greenland experts here in store. Deb's going to be our hostess yes. and pour us all a cocktail. And everybody's going to share some new things for spring. So we're going to have some fashion from Sharon. Mm -hmm. We're going to have some fun plant things like terrariums with Allison or Jillian. And some uh, great gardening um, s tools in that. Deb's going to share some new things. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about maybe a little windowsill herb garden, what herbs to choose, how to take care of them, and something just a couple fun things you could do at home with yourself or with the kids, right? Because right? they keep them busy with some gardening tasks. So yeah, we're going to have um, a few of us gather for five o'clock and, and you can register for that if you just go to our Facebook page. Or um, then you'll see all the details uh, on it, and you can pre-register for it. Um, there's uh, a few. There's quite a few spots left. We have quite a people. A lot of people signed up. Uh, Ty said last night, um, and so we're really looking forward to it. It's a great way. I myself have done it with girlfriends, hanging out yeah. and having a wine <laughs> Wednesday uh, on uh, Zoom, and it's it's a great time. It's just a really fun way to connect with all of you because we're missing you so much. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Definitely check that out. Um, so moving on then with the perennial edibles, uh, the next one, we covered strawberries, we covered rhubarb, it's time to talk about asparagus. Yes. So we have an example of one here. And uh, Tina, you mentioned with uh, rhubarb that it's a great ornamental plant as well, so mm -hmm. it blends into the landscape nicely. Asparagus is very much the same. It is. And so Joe was making fun of this plant in the pot, <laughs> saying... I'm going to say this is ornamental and it doesn't look like it. Asparagus is like a lot of perennials. You cannot see their full potential in the pot. Once they're in the ground though, they're outstanding. So I myself have a little patch of asparagus. The, 
the one thing about asparagus is patience, right? Yeah. So again, just kind of like rhubarb, we don't harvest asparagus actually into probably the third year. Right. And so mine last year was in the second year. I still did get, I would say, maybe like eight spears that I harvested off of it um, and left the rest that were there. Um, but you know what I have to say? If you've got space for it, um, it's... You'll never taste asparagus. Um, you'll never want to buy a grocery store asparagus yeah. again. Yeah. It's so tender. It's not woody at all. It's just, it's wonderful. And the thing about asparagus is having to give it a little bit of space in the garden. Unlike strawberries, it'll need a little bit bigger. And the great thing about it is that it will form a large patch. It, it, it perennializes or naturalizes in the garden. It does, yeah. So, and you can always go in and divide it too if you want to. Mm -hmm. Once it once it gets to be a you know a really big size, yeah. Um, but yeah, they're they really are. I mean, I've taken my perennial staff on garden tours in the past where we've seen established patches of it, yeah. And people look at it and go, "What is that?" Yeah. Because it looks like a giant upright fern. Yeah. Like it's very very it's very pretty. pretty. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so it just kind of has that double, um, double benefit to it. Yeah. Um, as far as varieties, it is well known that, you know, males are the most productive. Mm -hmm. So most of the, and I, I, I don't mean that in, in a, any weird <laughs> way, <laughs> but they are the most productive. So um, most of the you know, really good varieties that garden centers will carry are ones that are predominantly male hybrids. Yes. So uh, examples are Jersey Knight, Millennium. Yep. Um, and then there's the purple varieties like Purple Passion. Yeah. Those ones are not as productive as the green ones are. Right. But they will have nice thick spears. Yeah. So, and you will still get lots from them once, Absolutely. They've, yeah. once they've settled in. Yeah. Um, so... Like I say, lots of uh, really good varieties. As long as you're buying from a reputable garden center, you're probably getting a good variety. Yeah, and roots versus finished plants. Um, we, you can find asparagus roots in, in bags, similar to when you buy onion sets, right? Packaged in early spring. But know that typically you're purchasing them um, early in March, like or through the month of March, because A, they sell out. Um, and B, they, you know, they're where we're getting, most of the garden centers are getting their stock from, the package stock, is in places where their seasons start long before ours, like in four to six weeks before ours. So often um, when they're coming to us, we as a retailer are getting them early in March and they only stay so long in bags. So we have chosen to bring in our own bare root stock and plant it up now for the health of the plant because the roots in the bags, they, they just tend to rot out early. They weren't, we weren't giving people the healthiest um, roots that we could. So we prefer to pot them up. These crowns, we all potted up as a team together uh, in February and they were beautifully sized. We could hardly get them in the pots. Yeah. So uh, they're really nice sized crowns. And when you take them home and plant these into the ground, their asparagus is not particularly picky itself where it goes. Again, like strawberries, uh, the addition, like a nice um, light soil, a well-drained soil, uh, is uh, a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and other than that, there's not a ton of care for them. Nope. Just add a bit of compost at planting time. Add a bit of compost every spring like you would with most plants. Yeah. Don't plant it in a low-lying, poorly drained area. Yeah. Right? Um, and it, the one thing to remember is, just like your tulip bulbs and that, we are not cutting asparagus down in the fall. Right. Um, because we do want that naturally to take its reserves from that upper foliage growth and, and bring it down to the crown. So you do leave them standing over winter, but that's fine because they're beautiful against the snow. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. That's asparagus. Um, the next one to talk about, now we can get into some vines. Yeah. So uh, we kind of lump vines into perennials. Um, and there are two edible vines that will grow in this climate. And the first one we'll talk about is kiwis, mm -hmm. which are one that not everybody knows about. Now, these aren't going to be like your grocery store kiwis. They're not, you know, the big fuzzy fruits. Right. Um, but they taste identical. Yeah. Um, and they don't require peeling. So that's a nice thing. So they produce a berry that's maybe three quarters of an inch long, something yeah, like, like yeah, that. 
Like a grape. See what I'm doing? <laughs> like a grape, kind of, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they're smooth-skinned, right? Yep, smooth skin, so you can just eat them right off the vine, and uh, they ripen in the summertime. Absolutely delicious. Yeah. Now, two main types that are hardy for our area. Um, there's the Arctic kiwi. Right. And then there's the um, isai. Yes. And uh, isai is a different species. So the big difference between these two is that... Um, the Arctic kiwi is monoecious, meaning that it has one gender per vine. They're separate male and female vines. Right. And that means that you have to have a male Arctic kiwi and a female Arctic kiwi planted basically next to each other. Right. You, they say for, like, optimally four feet apart or so, right? Yeah. And one male can pollinate four females. Four females. Yeah, so for maximum yields, just get one male, four females, plant them in the same vicinity, and, uh, and that'll work. And the nice thing about Arctic kiwis too, Tina, is the foliage is very ornamental. It's gorgeous. Um, you will find where it's the females that produce the berries, the males have the more flashy foliage typically. Mm -hmm. So you will get foliage that is splashed in silver and pink. Yep. So very, very it's pretty. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So here's another example of where you have an edible plant that doubles as an, as an ornamental. Kiwis will tolerate partial shade. They yep. produce best in full sun, but they'll tolerate partial shade and will double as a privacy screen, that type of thing, yep. give you some vertical interest. Um, very, so, no pests. No pests, no yeah. Pests. That, and, and, you know, that's, that's a big point, actually, Tina, because a lot of the perennial vines do get things like leaf hopper and that sort of thing, aphids. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, especially remember when you are creating a privacy screen, you don't, if you're using something natural like vines to screen yourself in or to grow over a pergola, you don't, you would prefer to choose something that doesn't see a lot of pests, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that you're not, you know, having leaf hoppers visit you at dinner on the deck, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really big thing too. Now with Isai, uh, those guys do not have um, the patterned foliage and they uh, do not have as well the separate male and female plants. They're dioecious and they're self-fertile. So Isai right. is one that you can plant a single vine and get fruit on it. Yeah. Like with most fruiting plants, if you do plant multiple, you're obviously going to get better yields. Right. But um, so the benefit to Isai is if you want kiwis, you don't have the space for multiple plants, you can put one of those in and you'll still get kiwi fruit. Right. So uh, we are just, just a reminder, we're still taking questions. So if you're watching us live, feel free to ask those and Tyler will forward them to us. Um, just a couple more things on kiwis as far as planting and such. I mentioned full sun is ideal. They tolerate partial shade. Right. Uh, they will want to have some compost added to the soil. You don't want to go overboard with it, but definitely add a bit of compost to your soil. Um, not a lot of fertilizer is needed once they're established. Yeah. They don't even need a lot of pruning. Um, no, no, because they're not a incredibly, like they're not a aggressive vine right you know they they grow nice and compact and so yeah yeah what zones are the kiwis hardy to so they're asking what uh what zones are the kiwis hardy to arctic kiwi for sure zone three yeah. and isai honestly zone three as well sometimes you see it listed as zone four but it it has a native range that goes into zone three so it's yeah. zone three yeah so yeah. they're fairly reliable yeah yeah absolutely yeah. Um, you can get like with a lot of things, if it's a really severe winter, especially if they go into the winter without moisture, yeah. you can get some dieback on them, but they'll bounce back from it and make sure like with all of your plants that you're watering in before freeze up, Absolutely. it makes a huge difference, yeah. but they don't need mulch or anything like, like, uh, no, no protect. Like yeah. No winter protection. Yeah. yeah. Can I prune a wind burned apple tree now or wait until fall? So they're asking, can I prune a wind-burned apple tree now or wait till fall? Definitely do it now. Yeah. Yeah, now is the best time to prune the majority of trees and shrubs, which we'll get into shortly here. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll get into more detail on uh, pruning. Yeah. So, uh, so that's it for kiwis then. The last edible that we'll talk about is grapes, and then we'll kind of do a segue into, um, into pruning. We actually have a segue in question form. Would a kiwi like a sunny wall? What about grapes? Okay. okay, yeah, so 
they're uh, asking would kiwi like a sunny wall what about grapes um so yeah grapes we're just about to say actually love a sunny wall it's like the south facing side of your house is the best place to plant a yep, grape kiwis vine. would be fine there too but kiwis, grapes yep. yes love heat Absolutely. So that's one of the big things to get success with grapes is planted in the warmest location that yep. you have, the sunniest location that you have. Mm -hmm. And then like we talked about a bit with strawberries, um, this is very important with grapes is they don't like rich soil, not for producing. Right. Um, grapes you will find in rich soil or if they're over fertilized. Um, they will grow like mad and you will get tons of foliage, but very little fruit. So you want to plant them again in lean soil and you're only adding a little bit of compost at planting time to help with the structure of the soil. Yeah. Um, and again, you can add some bone meal to help with rooting. You can use a root booster fertilizer in that first season to right. get them established. Yeah. But beyond that, they require very little nutrients, if yeah. any. Yeah. yeah, I don't recommend fertilizing grapes at all unless you're seeing signs of nutrient deficiency. Right. So. Um, and they don't even, they don't want to have tons of water either. So if it's a dry year, you're watering deeply, maybe once a week type thing. Yeah. If that. If that. Yeah. Right. They're one um, of those great plants that can be thoroughly ignored once established. Yeah. It's what makes them such a great perennial edible. Absolutely. Um, now as far as varieties, um, actually one more thing I should mention, um, is pruning so and again we'll we'll talk more about pruning momentarily but a lot of people ask why isn't my grape producing if you're not fertilizing your soil isn't rich it's probably because you're not pruning enough so we'll we'll talk about that as well but um, varieties there's actually a lot of hardy varieties of grapes that do really well in Alberta um, if you're in northern Alberta or somewhere like a zone two area, mm -hmm. go for Valiant or Beta. Those are yeah. your two hardiest ones. And Valiant actually has, I think, really great fruit. Some people might disagree with me. Yeah, the key with Valiant, um, the taste is amazing. It's almost like a Concord grape. Mm -hmm. What some people don't like is it is a seeded grape. Mm -hmm. It's a small... Um, the fruit is like small peas, maybe a little bit bigger uh, in the clusters, but uh, the key is allowing a frost to hit that fruit before you consume it. You're never consuming it when it's still warm outside. Yeah. But once a frost hits it, those sugars, it, it, it does taste exactly like a Concord. And I was never a fan of the, the seeds myself, but I did, when I had my uh, Valiant in my yard, I did juice it a lot. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, I, I would describe it as a complex flavor. It's not a sugary sweet flavor. Again, like, like you said, Tina, if you let a frost hit it, it brings out the sugars in there, but yeah. it has a little bit of tartness as well. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. very juicy. Yes, very juicy. Yeah. You know, so that's what I like about it. And Concord has similar qualities. Um, people ask all the time, can we grow Concords here? And you can in a sheltered location. Right. But it's not reliably hardy, and I don't even right. carry it, to be honest with you, because no. it's not going to be as reliable yeah. as these other ones. Yeah. Um, but it's, again, the fruit is, is quite similar there. Um, there are other varieties like Frontenac, Frontenac Gris, um, Emerald Ice. Those ones are often listed as Zone 4, um, but we have had them growing on the property here in exposed areas for many years and they do exceptionally well. So they're pretty, they're pretty proven as far as I'm concerned, um, for most areas of Alberta, maybe not Northern Alberta, right? Mm -hmm. Again, stick with Valiant and Beta for more Northern areas. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so there's, there's lots of uh, choice there, but all of those varieties I've mentioned are seeded. Um, seedless hardy grapes do exist. They're just not mass produced on the market yet. We're hoping in the future varieties like Somerset, which is a seedless hardy right. grape, will, yeah. will become more readily available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and pruning with grapes um, is important because like uh, maples in our area, right? 
We do not prune grapes. Um, we prune them after they've leafed out in spring because uh, they are actively running sap just like the birch and the maples in spring and you can do quite a bit of damage by pruning um, at that time. So wait until the, le the vine is fully leafed out. Grapes can be one of the last things to leaf out so have patience uh, with them. Uh, there were some years that, you know, my willow tree was fully leafing out and the grape was just sitting there. Yeah. And uh, I thought, oh, is this the year that it finally died? But then two weeks later, they just take their time to leaf out. So yeah, there's something that you're putting a bit later uh, in the spring. They have to have fully leafed out. And they need the heat, right? That's, yeah. again, that's, that's another reason to plant it in the warmest part of the yard. Um, but the pruning with grapes is really important for yields. Um, and the way that grapes are pruned like in vineyards, right? And you don't necessarily have to do this extreme at home, but you know, 70 to 80% of the vine is taken off every year. And that's because grapes produce on new growth. So you are removing the majority of, you know, the previous season's growth and you're leaving your strongest canes to produce new growth from. Um, in a typical home situation, as long as you're going through and heading back a good portion of that older growth and taking out any weak spindly growth, that will give you a really good crop of berries. Um, yeah. The, and with vigorous ones like Valiant, you would probably want to keep on it. Mm -hmm. For years, I let, because it was still being very productive, we just let it grow and grow. And so we have a four level split. And so it did at one point grow into the screen of Brady's bedroom upstairs <laughs> it was the entire width of the house uh plus a pergola so that vine was like 30 in its in its end before it came down it was like at least 30 feet wide and it was about 20 feet tall but i had just let it go because i was still seeing right. fruit on it and i didn't particularly need a lot of fruit to yeah. me it was more ornamental yeah but uh they will the hardy hardy ones like that valiant will ramble as far as you want them to go so if you again weren't caring about the fruit and wanted a really nice thick screen they're super hardy and fast growing and great for that yeah. but if you want that production like joe said um it's a good point to make sure you head back a really good amount yeah. each time Definitely. Yeah. Um, so then talking about pruning on some other things, Tina. Yeah. Um, we mentioned earlier, this is the time to prune most things. Uh, we can talk about what some of those exceptions are, um, just to kind of clarify. So things that you won't prune at this time of year, you mentioned uh, maple, birch, right. right? Grapes also will bleed sap at this time of year. Yeah. Um, so those guys you're not doing until they're fully leafed out. We're not doing spring blooming shrubs. We're not right. pruning lilacs or double flowering plums, right? Or because mock otherwise, orange. mock orange, because otherwise you're removing this year's blooms. Right. Right. So those are done immediately after flowering. Uh, you want to be sure that you're not waiting like three or four weeks after flowering because they'll already be starting to form next year's flower buds. So right. immediately after flowering, prune those. And then evergreens would be the other exception that you're not pruning now. And this is one of our top questions that we always get is on evergreen pruning. Right. And a really common mistake that people make is they'll, first of all, they'll plant an evergreen tree in a location that the tree's mature size is too large for where they're planting it. Right. So then down the road, they end up cutting the top off because it's too tall. And then you have a flat topped evergreen for the rest of your life. So the, or for the rest of its life. So the, uh, the two things to keep in mind are one, make sure that you're planting the right tree for the right location. Right. So if you don't want it to get tall, make sure you're picking a dwarf variety at planting time. And then the other thing is prune throughout the evergreens life. So with evergreens, you're only pruning the new growth. If you prune into older growth, that's why when you top it, it doesn't grow back anywhere. They, they don't produce buds from older growth. Right. So the only growth you're pruning is current seasons. And you'll be clear like that. It's very clear to see current seasons because it's a different color, right? Mm -hmm. It'll be a, a brighter green or a brighter blue uh, on the spruce or the pines. Um, and we have actually on greenlandgarden.com, if you go to helpful tips, there's a lot of tip sheets on there. And in the pruning uh, section, pruning tip sheet, we do actually show you what we mean by when pruning, what growth you prune back on a pine versus a spruce right. versus uh, shearing a cedar. 
or a uh, upright juniper and yeah there are so many compact evergreen selections out there right now you don't need to choose a 40 foot blue spruce anymore yeah. Yeah. so and you'll find that if you do annually prune the new growth on evergreens you will get a much more attractive fuller very plant. dense yes yeah. beautiful yeah yeah so uh so yeah those are the exceptions to what you are the, those are the things you're not pruning now. Yeah, and I wanted to mention that um, it's really hard on, you know, uh, a podcast or uh, on our 630 Check Garden Show to uh, tell people how to prune or for them to visualize what we're saying. But um, you had done a pruning video in the Botanical Garden last fall yep. that is up on YouTube, uh, Greenland Garden. And so he does actually show you uh, where to prune, how to prune. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a great visual guide for you guys to use for pruning. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as everything else that we didn't mention that are exceptions, you know, now is the time to prune those things. So things like fruit trees, shrubs in general, right? Other than those uh, spring flowering shrubs, um, you know, most trees, right? Yeah. Now is the time to do those. And another thing that Aaron uh, and Tyler would have covered in Aaron's Getting Ready for Spring, which will be available Saturday, would have been pruning perennials or cutting back perennials yes. at this time, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. uh, any perennials that were left standing as the snow recedes, depending on your yard, um, you can start shearing all of that, that growth back. And um, so that will be in, in Aaron's video for sure. And so a really, can... sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, a really common one with that that we always get asked about is ornamental grasses. Yes. Right? Um, if you don't cut back your ornamental grasses now before they start into growth, you're going to end up with a mixture of new growth and old growth. Yeah. And a lot of people will send me pictures like in May and June and say, why is my grass half dead? And it's because they didn't cut back last yeah, year's growth. It's last year's growth, yeah. Yeah, yeah so. but it's very difficult if you let it get away on you to prune the dead growth away around that new exactly. flush coming up. So as soon as you the snow recedes and you can get uh, a hold of that. And pruning, though it sounds silly, with those ornamental grasses, let me tell you, to use your pruners, and hack away at a three foot Carl Forrester yeah. is exhausting. And yeah. so what Deb and I use is the pruning saws. Yes. They're like the Corona one we carry. Mm -hmm. I've had it forever. I use it to cut tree branches as big as this. Yeah. I use it for my grasses. I don't go anywhere without that thing. I love it. And yeah. so um, it shears those things back in a matter of like 30 seconds, seconds yeah. as opposed to, <laughs> yeah, so. So maybe we'll just wrap up with some questions. Yes. Um, so would the, grass, would the grapes like the same soil as rhubarb? So the question was, would, would grapes like the same soil as rhubarb? No, they like the opposite, actually. So rhubarb likes rich, uh, you know, moist soil. Grapes like sandy and dry. So totally different. Yeah. Okay. Do you carry sunchoke tubers? We don't carry the tubers, the sunchoke tubers. Um, they weren't available from our supplier this year for bulbs, but we do uh, bring in some finished plants in the edibles area of annuals, and those would be available sometime in May, so you can always give us a shout. And last question, my dahlia tubers are sprouting in the house. Best way to prevent leggy growth. They're sitting in front of a self-facing self windows, no heat net. Okay. So dahlia tubers sprouting in the house. They're trying to make sure that the growth isn't leggy. Uh, we are now, I looked at the forecast this morning and I was elated because they're forecasting like plus 18 next yes. week. Yeah. When you're seeing weather above like six, seven degrees during the day, put the plants outside. That's yes. the best thing that you can do. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously you don't want to expose them to frost. So bring them in at night as long as it's freezing. Yeah. Um, yeah, Joe and I were discussing yesterday, um, you know, we wanted to make sure because we're starting to get asked a lot, when can I plant? And so right now, um, we are not going to be planting like in and around our area, our last frost free day, we aim to plant May long weekend. However, campers know that it snows May long weekend, or it's really <laughs> cold and rainy a lot of years. Yeah. So um, it depends, like right now, we're just saying you would hold off, not even think about planting out till the third, fourth week in May. However, what Joe just said about the dahlia and also about anything you're growing at home, tomatoes, lettuce, all of that, any of your seedlings, on a day above 7 degrees Celsius, put all of those outside for about three to four hours, but choose a sheltered spot. You don't want them in a hot, south, windy spot. 
So put them maybe against the house. Even a shaded spot is giving them a gorgeous amount of light as compared to what they're getting inside. And that three to four hours, that natural wind um, or the light breeze helps strengthen the stems and the stalks of, of little transplants. So uh, next week is going to be phen phenomenal. I think even come this weekend, like Saturday, Sunday, the days might be above that seven. So I would use that um, for that dahlia, that opportunity to get it outside for a bit. Definitely. So that's all the time we have, folks. Um, thank you so much to everybody who tuned in live. Yeah. And if you're listening to us uh, after the broadcast, thank you for listening as well. Uh, this has been episode three of In the Garden with Greenland. A reminder that you can watch our videos on our YouTube channel at Greenland Garden anytime. And the podcast will also be available audio only on all the major platforms. So thank you so much and take care.